Well, I'm very glad to join you here today and want to thank Salford University for organising this conference. I think it's always very valuable to bring together human rights defenders and those who think and write and organise around human rights so that we share our experiences and learn from each other, both within this country and with our friends and comrades internationally. As you all know, I'm involved in a wide range of human rights campaigns in the United Kingdom and worldwide, including in Palestine, West Papua, Russia, Zimbabwe, Iran and Pakistan, to name just a few. Um, these campaigns are all about international solidarity to support those brave, courageous human rights defenders in those countries who are often operating in conditions of great tyranny and oppression. As we know during the struggle against apartheid, it was very important to South Africans who were struggling for freedom to know that the world was on their side. And the international campaign against apartheid was a very important and valued counter uh, to the apartheid regime and a very important augment to the internal struggle by the South African people themselves. But I guess I'm best known for my work on lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender human rights. Um, it is this work that I want to share with you uh, today. And rather than saying lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender every time, I will just abbreviate it to LGBT. Um, I began campaigning for LGBT human rights way back in 1969 at the age of 17. Um, I'd already been active in various other human rights work, but it was then that I realised that I was gay. And I can remember very clearly in late 1969 making a conscious decision that I would do something, I didn't quite know what, something to help progress the cause of LGBT freedom. Um, I didn't really have any model. I didn't have a template. I didn't come from a political family. I came from the suburbs, very conservative working class background. Nothing prepared me for this decision that I'd made. But I did have an awareness about historical struggles, in particular the struggles of the suffragettes, who I felt a great emotional and political connection with, and also the struggle of the black civil rights movement in the United States, which was contemporary with my own uh, awareness of, of my sexuality. During the 1960s, the nightly TV bulletins were filled with news about the Freedom Riders in the Deep South, about the Black Panthers, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, this historic, momentous struggle for black freedom in the United States. And I was able to look at that struggle and take inspiration from it, to see that these were the methods that black communities in America were using to fight for their freedom. So why couldn't I and we use similar methods to fight for queer freedom as well. So I began this journey um, inspired by uh, the suffragettes and the black civil rights movement. Um, and of course, the more I learned, the more further inspiration I got, you know, reading Gandhi, um, being able to adapt his ideas about nonviolence civil disobedience to the contemporary struggle for LGBT human rights. I can remember thinking in that period, late 1969, that I had sort of three basic aims. The first was to take LGBT rights from the margins to the mainstream. Uh, the second was to make LGBT human rights acceptable and respectable. And the third was to end legal discrimination against LGBT people in the UK and also to help change public consciousness, to change hearts and minds, to change public opinion, because I knew that it was no use having perfect equality laws if attitudes remained homophobic. So those were the three aims that I began with. 
And I also remember thinking, I wonder how long this is going to take. And I thought to myself, hmm, I studied other movements, and I thought, if we're lucky, maybe 50 years. Maybe 50 years we'll get legal equality at least within 50 years. In the end, I was proven somewhat pessimistic because it only took 40 years to end nearly all homophobic legal discrimination in the UK. You know, that, has been achieved, that had been achieved by 2009, uh, 40 years from 1969 when I began. And of course, over the last decade, since 1999, when the ban on lesbian and gay people serving in the armed forces was lifted, since then, virtually every single homophobic law in Britain has been repealed. An astonishing, extraordinary pace of change. The fastest, most successful law reform campaign in this country's history. When you think that Britain, in the 1980s, had more homophobic laws than any other country on earth, even more than the communist bloc, the Soviet Union. Um, and some of those laws dated back not decades, but centuries. When you think about it, the law that sent Oscar Wilde to prison in 1895, the law which is called gross indecency between men, was only repealed in 2003. The first major anti-sodomy law uh, enacted in the time of King Henry VIII in 1533 was only finally repealed in 2003. So it has been a very long, momentous period of law reform and social change. And I mentioned that nearly all homophobic laws have been repealed. The one major one that's outstanding is, of course, the ban on same-sex civil marriage. Now, of course, in Britain we do have same-sex civil partnerships, which do address many of the injustices and inequalities that faced uh, same-sex couples who, until 2004, 2005, had no legal recognition or rights whatsoever. Up until that point, same-sex relationships, love and commitment between people of the same sex did not exist and was not acknowledged in British law. But civil partnerships changed that. And I would not for one moment wish to diminish the significance, importance and value of those changes. But having said that, civil partnerships are not equality. The only true equality is same-sex civil marriage. And I say that as someone who shares the feminist critique of marriage and who personally would not want to get married myself. But nevertheless, I defend absolutely the right of other people to make that choice. And that choice should be available to everyone, regardless of gender or sexual orientation. And you know, many people, even in the LGBT movement and community, say, well, what's the fuss about? You know, civil partnerships have almost all the rights that go with civil marriage. Why make a fuss? Well, I think it's the whole separate but equal argument, or rather, separate but not equal argument. Um, you know, black people in South Africa fought against apartheid because there were separate laws for black people and white people. And they said, quite rightly, there should be one law for everyone. Everyone should be equal regardless of race. So for me, I look at this issue in much the same way. To me, the distinction between civil partnerships and civil marriage, where civil marriage is reserved for heterosexual couples and civil partnerships are reserved for same-sex couples, to me, this is a form of sexual apartheid. Differentiation in law based on sexual orientation, which flies in the face of the democratic ethos that we should all be equal before the law. And it concerns me greatly that we now have a situation where the homophobia of the ban on same-sex civil marriage is now compounded and extended by the heterophobic ban on opposite-sex civil partnerships. Because just as a same-sex couple cannot have a civil marriage, an opposite-sex couple cannot have a civil partnership. 
And I think we need to say very loud and clear, two wrongs do not make a right. That just as a same-sex couple should have the choice or the option to have a civil marriage, so a heterosexual couple should have the option to have a civil partnership. And I know quite a few of my feminist friends who would be delighted to be able to choose the different option of a civil partnership rather than what they see as the baggage of patriarchy that goes with traditional marriage. So that's, the, that's really the last big issue. In terms of how we got here, um, it was a long, arduous struggle. Um, lesbian and gay human rights were back in the late 1960s not deemed acceptable or respectable. Uh, politicians and parties almost universally ignored the issue. To get any debate in Parliament was impossible. Parliament would not, would not agree to debate LGBT human rights because they were regarded as so contemptible, so immoral, so beyond the pale that this was too disgusting to bring before a parliament. So all attempts to get parliament to debate were refused. You had a handful, and I mean literally four or five MPs and four or five members of the House of Lords who would raise issues in parliament. But government ministers would bat them away with no proper answers. So when they tried to get statistics on how many lesbian and gay people were being drummed out of the armed forces, they'd have to ask dozens of questions and pressure and pressure and pressure to get an answer because the government regarded it as a disgusting, vile, immoral question to ask. Homosexuality was so reviled that they would not even give the statistics about the numbers of service personnel being drummed out. Of course, eventually they did. Eventually, through the persistence of a handful of MPs, they did. And that's how we learned uh, about uh, the homophobic persecution of military personnel. The same goes with the number of um, LGBT people being arrested for consenting offences. You know, for years, the Home Office covered this up until we discovered you know, that far from decreasing, after the partial decriminalisation of male homosexuality in 1967, the number of arrests and convictions for consenting same-sex behaviour increased. In fact, in the early 1970s, it was four times greater than in the mid-1960s before so-called decriminalisation. So we had a decriminalisation which was accompanied by ever greater repression. We also had the situation where the media, if it wasn't overtly and viciously homophobic, would just ignore the issue. And someday, someone is going to write the story about the Guardian's response to LGBT human rights. Britain's main liberal paper has an absolutely shameful record in terms of covering LGBT human rights abuses. It's only really in the last 15 or 20 years that The Guardian has gun begun to report these issues in an objective and reasonable way. In the 60s and 70s, you had dozens of queer bashing murders which The Guardian refused to report. You had thousands and thousands of gay men being arrested, which The Guardian either put as a little tiny news in brief, but would never give any proper substantive coverage. In 1989, the number of gay and bisexual men convicted for consenting offences like gross indecency, which only apply to same-sex relationships, the numbers convicted in 1989 were almost in great, as great as in 1954-55, in a period when homosexuality was totally illegal and when uh, the country was gripped by a McCarthyite homophobic witch hunt. Yet the Guardian newspaper would give hardly any coverage to this scale of repression. You had to plead and beg to get a story in there. They did not regard it as respectable. And that says a lot about the individual journalists and the editorship of The Guardian in that period. Of course, even mainstream human rights organisations were not supportive of LGBT human rights. You know, hats off to Irene Khan and others who have taken a stand but let's not forget that right up until the early 1990s, 
Amnesty International refused to campaign against homophobic persecution and for people who were jailed on account of their sexuality. Refused. Myself and my colleagues from Outrage had to go and occupy the headquarters of Amnesty International, chain the doors locked, but to get massive publicity which forced Amnesty International to eventually change. The same with every other major human rights organisation. Until around the late 80s or early 90s, they would not campaign on LGBT human rights because it was regarded as unrespectable and unacceptable. But we did change it in the end. And we changed it how? Lobbying by and large failed. Lobbying the police, the judiciary, the courts, politicians, newspaper editors, parliament, by and large lobbying failed. And after trying lobbying, and I believe you and me, we did try doing things within the system, you know, trying to have meetings with government ministers, with police commissioners and so on. After that failed, we resorted to direct action. And there were two objectives in mind. One was to expose, shame and embarrass those in power who were enforcing homophobic laws and supporting homophobic discrimination. And also through high profile spectacular protests, put these issues in the news to get people thinking and talking about them, to raise public consciousness. I can remember in the early 1990s when I did the research to uncover the true scale of arrests and convictions for consenting homosexual behaviour in this country, when that was publicised, the universal reaction from most people, even many who were quite homophobic, was, we had no idea. We had no idea. And I think that the protests we did, like the famous kissing in Piccadilly Circus in 1990, you know, this was at a period when same-sex couples were being arrested and taken to court and convicted for kissing, touching, holding hands or cuddling in a public place. No heterosexual couple was being arrested for that kind of behaviour, but lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender people were right up until the 1990s. When we held that kiss in, first of all it drew public attention to the fact that these arrests and convictions were taking place. Secondly, it put the police on the spot so at the night of the kiss-in, which was held in Piccadilly Circus with 300 couples daring the police to arrest them, the night of that protest, one hour beforehand, I received an emissary from the then Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Paul Condon, saying that as of five o'clock today, no same-sex couple will be arrested for merely kissing, cuddling or holding hands in the Metropolitan Police District. So we won even before the action took place. And so it was with all the other issues around policing. You know, we tried negotiating with the police. You know, we, we had meetings at Scotland Yard, but the police would sit there, smile, shake our hands, give us tea and sandwiches, and then just go away and order another series of raids. So after three or four months of this, we decided it ain't working. This is just a PR exercise by the Metropolitan Police. And we took an inspiration from the black movement, which also had to fight a battle against the sus laws and other racist policing policies. Sometimes you have to confront those in power. So that's what we did. We began a high-profile campaign of disrupting the press conferences of the then Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Sir Paul Condon, um, invading and occupying police stations that were organising raids and entrapment operations, and also exposing the pretty police, the police in those days used to send young, handsome officers dressed in tight white jeans, black leather jackets and boots into public toilets and parks. They'd wave their willies around and anybody who responded would get arrested. So we used to lie in wait and photograph these officers and then put their photos, staple them on trees in parks or on lampposts or inside public toilets, warning people that this was a police argent provocateur. I can tell you, within three months of that campaign, Within three months, the police were begging for us to come back to, to, to resume negotiations. <laughs> and ever being generous, we did. And we came back with a set of demands, a set of concrete policies for a non-homophobic policing policy. And within one year, the Metropolitan Police had agreed to three quarters of those demands. 
Three quarters. And the, the one thing they always said in retrospect, not at the time, but some, some years afterwards, first of all, the protest campaign was deeply embarrassing and you know, created incredible discomfort at high levels because our message was, why are the police wasting all these resources on arresting gay and bisexual men for victimless behaviour where no one has complained and no one has been harmed when they can't deal with armed robberies, street assaults, racist attacks, domestic violence, rapes, queer bashings and so on? Why are they putting their resources into victimless crimes when they should be putting them into crimes with real victims? And that was really embarrassing for the police and really helped win public opinion on our side. Most ordinary people felt that even if they didn't agree with homosexuality, this was a misplaced set of policing priorities. So in the, in the end, the police did change. Within a year, three quarters of our demands for non-homophobic policing policy were adopted. Within three years, the number of gay and bisexual men arrested and convicted for consenting behavior fell by two thirds. The biggest, fastest fall ever recorded. And that literally saved thousands thousands of gay and bisexual men from arrest, conviction, and all the consequent things like, in those days, losing your job, if that person was married, the breakup of their marriage, and so on, and so on, and so on. I think it's a classic example of how direct action worked when all the negotiations and lobbying had failed. The other thing the police always say in retrospect was that we weren't just protesting, we weren't just oppositionist and negative, when we came back into those negotiations, we had a set of concrete policies, thought out policies about how the police could shift to a non-homophobic policing policy. And we adapted some of these from the experience of the Netherlands, Denmark and other countries in Europe, which had already changed. So presenting them with practical, tangible alternative policies was also a very important ingredient to winning that successful policing change. I'll just finish with just one other example. Um, you may recall the outing of the bishops in 1994, where Outrage, the LGBT human rights group, uh, outed 10 Anglican bishops. That was not a method of first resort. It was last resort. We had pleaded with the church to reconsider its homophobic policies. We'd asked for meetings with the then Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. George Carey, and been refused. He would not even meet with us. So we decided we had to up the ante. And we said very clearly, if the church persists in pursuing these homophobic policies, not only condemning homosexuality and, and sacking and persecuting gay priests, but supporting homophobic laws. Because of course, the Church of England was a key factor, or the leadership of the Church of England was a key instrument in opposing gay equality in the 1990s. The Archbishop of Canterbury was against an equal age of consent, against the recognition of same-sex relationships, against lesbian and gay couples being allowed to foster or adopt children, and so on. So we gave them a warning. We said, if you don't stop this homophobia, do not be surprised if we retaliate. We know there are key people in high positions in the church who are homophobic in public, but homosexual in private. And we will expose them if they don't stop their homophobia. We gave them a warning. They didn't think we would carry it out, but we did. We named those 10 bishops on the opening day of Synod in London in 1994. It caused, I think if you remember, shock waves, not only throughout the church, but throughout the wider society. But the end result of it was, first of all, as far as I know, every single one of those 10 bishops ceased, ceased publicly endorsing homophobic discrimination. Uh, two went on to actually become strong allies of the gay community. Um, subsequently, a month later, the House of Bishops passed what is to this day its strongest ever condemnation of homophobic discrimination, something it would have never ever done if we had not outed those bishops. But we outed them, I emphasize, not because they were gay and not because they were in the closet, but because they were hypocritical homophobes. They denounced gay people in public while having gay relationships in private. Um, the final thing I would finish on is that at the time, we were widely ridiculed and denounced as, as basing the naming of the bishops on mere rumor or gossip. Not true. We did our research very well. We could have named four others, 
but we weren't entirely convinced about the sources of information. We thought there was an element of doubt, so we didn't name them. But of those 10, we were absolutely certain. And I was very, very gratified that some years later, I was talking at a meeting like this, and an elderly man came up to me after I'd finished speaking. And he said, oh, very pleased to meet you, Mr. Tatchell. Um, I want to let you know that um, you, know, you got a lot of stick for allegedly claiming the bishops, you know, it was all based on gossip and rumor. He said, I'm a doctor, I can't break my Hippocratic Oath, but I want you to know that at least one of those bishops you named was most definitely gay. And I said, oh, how do you know that? And he said, well, I can't go into too much detail, but I'll tell you this since, since you won't know who I'm talking about. He said, the bishop concerned once came to me in my surgery um, saying he had a little rectal problem. So I told the bishop, um, if you want to you know, drop your trousers, get up on the table, put your head down here, stick your bum in the air, and let me have a look. So the bishop got up on the table, put his head down, stuck his bum in the air, pulled down his trousers. And the doctor said to the bishop, um, well, bishop, um, where exactly is the problem? And the bishop said to the doctor, well, it's, it's, doctor, it's ju just here, just by the entrance. To which the doctor said, <clears throat> excuse me, bishop, most of us call it the exit. <laughs> on that note, I thank you all. <laughs> just for the final thing, uh, final, final thing. Takes a while to count, okay. <laughs> Have a good laugh, please. <laughs> It takes many small streams to make a mighty river. I am very proud to have been one of the thousands of small streams that have helped make the mighty river for queer freedom. Thank you.